All right, so uh, uh, let me just remind you the last time. Oh, yeah, before I move on, I will say that I, I made a mistake as last time. So I claim that uh, you know, if you have a p-data and all-soft representation, and you have two row equivalent continuous transverse maps, then you have to, be, uh, they have to agree. You have to assume the, the contraction property. Right? In the definition of uh, an OSOP, we have the second contraction property. You have to assume that for this to be true. OK? All right. So. Uh, but it's OK if uh, the image is risky dense, right? Then we don't have to assume. Yes, if the image is risky dense, in fact, that, uh, you, need, um, you still need like, uh, the property that it's um, dynamics preserving. Yeah. So I think that was uh, due to Gisha Vinhart. <coughs> okay, um, so last time we also talked, uh, we also gave you um, two examples of uh, non soft representations, but they're all of surface groups. Okay, so uh, today uh, I'm going to give you one more example that's not of, a, well, one class of examples that are not, that's not of surface groups. Okay, so this is, um, uh, so this is uh, uh, pro uh, examples via, prop or examples from, Convex projective geometry. Okay, and this is really uh, the work of Andrew Zimmer and uh, uh, Densiger Garrido Cassell. Okay, so we saw this already, but let me just remind you the definition again. Okay, we saw this in Black's talk. So, what is a properly convex domain? So, a properly convex domain. Okay, it's an open set, omega, inside of P of Rd, okay, uh, that whose closure uh, lies in an affine chart. Of uh, PRD. And it's convex in the affine chart. Okay, so in the case when d when your when the d equals to three, uh, your p of r three is r p two, and if you take the board to be your affine chart of r p two, then your properly convex domain looks like this. Right, its closure lies in here, and you pick any two points in the domain. You can find a projective line segment between them that lies inside of the domain. Okay. Okay. So whenever you have a properly convex domain, then you can look at its automorphism group, which is the group of projective transformation that leave this domain invariant. Okay. And if you have a discrete subgroup of omega, you can define this thing called the orbital limit set. So that gamma is our odd omega will be discrete. Okay, then you define the orbital limit set of gamma. So this is um, the set of uh, points of the form the limit as n approaches infinity of gamma n times O. Okay, such that uh, gamma n is a sequence in gamma is a sequence in gamma and O is uh, some point in omega. A little bit bigger tangent. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so you look at, you pick, your, you pick any point, you pick any sequence, you look at the limit, that's a point in the orbital limit set. You do that over all possible choices. Okay? <clears throat> all right, so here's a, uh, first definition. Um, first, I say that uh, the group gamma inside of all omega is uh, projectively visible. Okay, if uh, the following conditions hold. Okay, so first. Okay, so the first condition I want to hold is that if you take any pair of points in the orbital limit set, 
sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. If you pick a pair of points in the orbital limit set, okay, then when you look at the projective line segment between them, that lies inside of omega bar. Okay, so omega is convex, so if you pick two points in the boundary, you look at the projective line segment between them, it has to lie in the boundary. Okay, but I require this to actually lie in the domain itself. Okay, without the endpoints, of course. Okay, so you, if you're standing at any point of orbital limit set, you can see any other uh, point of orbital limit set by going through the domain. Okay? So, sorry. In your definition of orbital limit set, do you allow, do you fix the base point? No. Or? Yeah, so it's some point, or I don't fix the base point. For all gamma yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, and uh, the second uh, second condition I want is um, I also want that I want that for every point x in the orbital limit set. Okay, basically you have a unique supporting hyperplane. So there exists a unique projective hyperplane. H. Uh, that contains x, okay, and but it does not intersect the domain. Okay, so the picture, so the the picture for one is like this. Okay, so this is your domain. If you pick two points inside of the boundary, uh, in the limit set, not the boundary, the limit set. Okay, then the line segment between them has to go stay inside of the the boundary, uh, inside of the domain. Okay, and for the, the picture for the second one is something like this, right? If you have a, your domain here and you have a point, okay, then you have like, something like this. You know, if you see one, then you have a unique uh, hyperplane that passes through this point but doesn't intersect the domain. Okay, so what is bad is something like this, right? You have something like this, this is bad, because now you have many hyperplanes through that point that doesn't intersect the domain, okay? Okay, so this is a projectively, uh, is projectively visible, okay? So the, the, the point, I guess, uh, wh why these two conditions, right? So it turns out that with these two conditions, you can ensure that the gamma action on the orbital limit set it's a, uni it's a convergence group action, okay? So then uh, now, if I want a north softness, then I need, some, I need to make sure that this, this uh, convergence group action is uniform. And so I do that by uh, making a version of convex co-compactness, right? So I say that uh, if uh, in addition, okay, when you take the convex hull in omega, Okay, of uh, the orbital limit set gamma, and you quotient this out by gamma. Okay, so the orbital limit set is a gamma invariant. I mean, I, I mentioned there's a gamma action there. That's actually because I'm projectively visible as a convergence group action. So I can take the hull of uh, this limit set inside of omega. So there's now a subset of omega, and there's a gamma invariant as well. I can co take the quotient. Okay, so if this is compact. Okay, then, uh, I don't know, so I couldn't find a name for this property in the, in the literature, so I'm just gonna make, but this is not standard, I'm gonna make it up, right? So I, then, uh, then gamma is, uh, weak, I call this weakly regular, con regularly convex co-compact. Okay, so in the case when your gamma is irreducible, then this condition agrees with uh, what uh, Andrew Zimmer in his paper calls regularly convex co-compact. Okay, but in the irreducible case, but in general, this is slightly weaker. Okay, and so, uh, and then it, oh, this, also, this, uh, this condition also shows up in uh, the DGK paper, but they didn't give it a name. It was just, they have a list of different conditions that are equivalent, and this is one of them, okay? All right, so here's the, here's the example. I mean, here's the theorem that, that, that makes this an example of uh, of, of uh, north of representations. Okay, let me make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, so I'm gonna let gamma 
inside of PGLDR, the discrete. Okay, so first uh, there exists, uh, okay, if there exists an omega inside of PRD, okay, such that uh, gamma lives inside of all omega and it's, uh, it's weakly regularly convex co compact. Also, so it's, it's projectively visible and weak. Yeah, so, 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 uh, wait, I, I'm missing one board. Wait. Uh, yeah, so, if, in addition, in addition, yeah. Okay, so if uh, this is weakly regularly convex compact, then gamma is P1 and loss of. Okay, uh, and then they have a converse to this as well. So if um, gamma inside of P, inside of PGLDR, okay, if gamma is uh, is P one and also okay, and uh, and gamma lies in odd omega for some omega. Okay, then you can then uh, there actually is a uh, strictly convex omega with C one boundary. Okay, such that gamma lies in omega. Lies in odd omega. Omega prime, different omega. Okay? <coughs> is it necessary to assume that gamma is a subgroup of automorphism of omega for some omega? Yes. So there are examples of P1 and Nosov subgroups of PGLDR that do not leave any, pro any properly convex domain invariant. So you have to assume that. But once you assume that, then what they're saying here is you can, by modifying your, your domain a little bit, you can actually make it strictly convex with C1 boundary and uh, gamma X on it. I see. And is weakly uh, regular convex to compact there? Yeah, so, so I, I forgot to mention that if you, if you, are C, if you have C1 boundary, this, this condition, if you are strictly convex, then, this, then the the first condition he automatically holds. Yes, yes, but the, the, weak, the fact that the quotient is compact. Yes, yes. So, so if, if yeah, because basically, if you're P1 and Nosov, your gamma here has to be hyperbolic and he has to act on it on the limit set as a convergence group action. Yeah, but you didn't write it. <coughs> you didn't write it in your theorem as a conclusion that also the the convex L in omega prime of the, the limit set of gamma. It, Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you. Yeah. So okay, it's really regularly complex, complex. But in this case, it's actually okay. So maybe a better way to say it is then the if you look at the convex hull of the limit set and you quotient it by gamma, that's compact. Right? Um, prime, thank you. And this implies politically visible, right? Hmm? This implies you also are politically visible? Yes, yes, because you're C, if, you're, if you're strictly convex, you're ah, strictly, strictly convex. convex C1 boundary that will ensure you're projectively visible. I have a quick question. For the first omega, so like your gamma is in omega for some mm -hmm. omega, not omega prime. That one is properly convex, a properly convex domain? 
domain. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, everything here, when I do, yeah, all the omegas, omega primes are all properly convex domains. Great. Thank you. What theorem is that? Thank you very much. So this is uh, Densigo Garrido Cassell Zimmer. And gamma is assumed to be irreducible in this theorem, or? No, yeah, so, so uh, you, you don't need gamma to be redu uh, irreducible here, but I think Zimmer, if you, you proved it in the irreducible case. So let me make sure, I, maybe I should write that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the example I wanted to bring up, and that's it. Okay. So the last half an hour, okay, I'm going to try to breeze through uh, the last perspective of, um, of a Nossoff representation that, that I mentioned at the very start, right, which is this um, uh, cost geometry perspective. Okay, but I'm not sure how far I can get with this. So maybe let me state the... So because of that, I'm going to have to... I'm going to try to state the theorems before I state the definitions. Okay, and I might not get to the definitions. So I hope, I'm, I'm, I apologize for that in the first. Okay, so, so this is the last part. The non of representations via the symmetric space. <coughs> okay, so, um, so, I think that the perspective here is you want to do, you want to, you want to, in the rank one situation, in, in, the, in HN, right, convex co-compactness, I mean, the fact that that's equivalent to requiring your orbit maps to be a uh, quasi-isometry, a uh, quasi-isometric embedding, right, is a very useful, I mean, it's a very nice perspective, right? And you want to try to um, uh, trans see how much that works inside of the higher rank symmetric space. Okay, but right off the bat, you run into some problems. Okay, so the nice thing about uh, hyperbolic spaces is that the quasi-geodesics are very well behaved. Okay, so let me write down two um, important results in that setting. Okay, so XB, metric space. Okay, so first I need to tell you what's a quasi-geodesic. I don't think I've done that yet. Okay, so if you have, you pick your two constants again, big C and little c, okay, a CC quasi-geodesic, okay, and sometimes I will use quasi-geodesic rays as well, or quasi-geodesic segments, okay, uh, it's a CC QI embedding, Okay, uh, f from r to x, or in the case when I have a geodesic ray, my f goes from a ray in r to x, or if it's, I'm on quasi-geodesic segments, then my f goes from a segment to x. Okay. Okay, so if X is hyperbolic, okay, then uh, the following two statements hold. Okay, so the first, the first uh, kind of nice property about quasi geodesics inside of uh, delta hyperbolic spaces is called the Moss lemma. Okay, and basically what it says is that if you take your, your two constants CC, then from these two constants you can find another one, D larger than zero, such that if you have, a, if F from I to X is a CC quasi-geodesic, it can be a ray as well or a segment, doesn't matter. Okay, then there exists a geodesic. Okay, correspondingly a ray or a segment. Okay, 
L such that if you look at the image of your quasi geodesic, this lies inside of a D neighborhood of this geodesic. Okay? <clears throat> So th this is quite nice. So for example, one thing it implies is that if you take a quasi geodesic in the delta hyperbolic space and you follow it and it goes and, and you follow it to infinity, it's going to hit the visual boundary at one point. Okay. Okay, so this is the first one. The second Sorry, so before you go on, so <laughs> for instance, the kitchen, so, I mean, do we know that the gamma can be contained in O2 of some convex domain or not? Uh, no, so in, in the case, it, it, it depends on the parity of the dimension. So, for example, when, when D is even, the, you, you never lie in the, the, the limit curve, it's not proper. Uh -huh. mm. It's just whether or not the Veronese embedding is homotopically trivial. If this was an affine chart, it couldn't be non-homotopically trivial, and it's the generator, the fundamental proof, and uh, even automated. Okay, so that's the the Mohs lemma. The second uh, the second nice property that quasi geodesics have in the uh, in in delta hyperbolic spaces is called the local to global principle. Okay, and basically what it gives you uh, what it does is it gives you a way to verify the quasi-geodesic property locally, okay? Because the quasi-geodesic property as given is a global property, and you check every pair of points along your geodesic, okay? So, uh, this is what it says. Okay, so first I need to tell you what's a, what is a local quasi-geodesic. So I say a map F from I to X is an R local CC quasi-geodesic. Okay, if whenever you take a pair of points T1, T2 in I, they are not too far apart, so such that their distance is less than R. Okay, then when you take F and you restrict it to this interval, okay, then this guy here is a CC quasi geodesic. Okay. And then the, the local to global prop, uh, principle says that uh, if, um, so I'll say like, uh, so the uh, local to global principle Okay, so uh, there exists, okay, given CC Okay, you can find some D Okay and some C prime and big C prime and little C prime. Uh, hold on, let me check. Where's the D dependence? That's right, okay. There exists D, let's call it R. Okay. Okay, so for any C, C, you can find R, C prime, and big C prime, and little C prime, such that any R local C, C quasi geodesic. Is a C prime 
C prime quasi geodesic. Okay, so this quasi being a quasi geodesic is a property that can be verified locally. Okay, now both of these uh, these results fail the moment you have a copy of R two inside of your symmetric space. Okay, so these fail in R two. Okay, so the the example. The kind of the standard example of the the failure of the of the Morse lemma is this thing called the logarithmic spiral. So you look at the the curve inside of R two parametrized by R goes to R and log R. So this is uh, in polar coordinates. Okay, uh, and then uh, so it looks something like this. Okay, there's a spiral like this, and you can actually verify that this guy here, uh, this is a square two zero uh, quasi geodesic. Quasi -geodesic. Okay, but it definitely does not stay a bounded distance from any line inside of the plane. Okay, but does not stay uh, bounded from any line. Okay, and then the failure of the local to global principle. So it's quite. Okay, I can give you the example quickly. Okay, so if you take, if you choose any r larger than zero, okay, then. If you look at the square of side lengths r, okay, this so you just you uh, you just look at the curve that you're just going along the square. Can okay, you keep going around, right? So this guy is again is a square root two zero. It's the r local square root two zero quasi geodesic. Okay, but it's definitely not a global quasi geodesic because you, you keep coming back to the same point. Okay? Okay? <coughs> so basically, if you want to look in the symmetric space, then this just looking at the, 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 the family of the, the class of these quasi geodesics, right? Doesn't have very good properties. Okay, so. What uh, Kapovich, Leap, and Porti, what they want to do is they want to find a smaller class, so, so a, a, a special class of quasi geodesics in the Riemannian symmetric space M, okay, even in higher rank, right, where both of these, uh, some version of both of these theorems hold. Right, some version of the Moss lemma. And um, and the local to global principle holds. Okay. <clears throat> and so I think the, the main idea here is you don't you, when you when you think about the Morse lemma now, you no longer want your curves to track a geodesic anymore. That's too much. Okay, so instead what they want to do is they want to replace geodesics. You know, like uh, your quasi geodesics tracking your geodesics, they don't want that anymore. They replace this with parallel sets. Okay, which I hope that I can get to define. And then uh, instead your for your geodesic rays. Okay, so for your, your quasi-geodesic rays, instead of staying close to geodesic rays now, 
you want them to stay close to this thing that's called wild cones. Uh oh, okay, and uh, do the six segments. Okay, uh, you replace these things, this with uh, what they call diamonds. Yeah. Is there some way one can attach some kind of winding number constant here? Because, like, with respect to the vial, vial group, it's like, look at this picture. It's leaving the vial chamber. Is yeah. there some way to, like, associate an invariant to make it, to, like, know that it stays inside there? Like, I mean, not a synthetic can, definition, but, like, a number you can compute? Well, you can, you can, uh, you can require your quasi geodesic to be regular. That means as you move along, it, 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 and that's, that's actually... Yeah, but that's, yeah. again, a lot of information. I want, yeah. I want a number. I don't know. Oops. Uh, okay. Or a vial chamber value thing. Excuse me. More than that. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, and then uh, once you have this, so what they do now is they define a class of uh, geodesics that they call the MOS quasi geodesics, where they basically force um, the MOS lemma to hold. Okay, I'll, uh, hopefully I'll get to that, and then you can see what I mean by that. And then for that class of qu MOS quasi geodesics, they prove the local to global principle. Okay. Okay, so uh, they they come up with this notion of a MOS. Quasi geodesic. Okay? And this, this notion here, I mean that it, it depends on some choices. You have to choose a theta instead of delta. So you have to choose some parabolic subgroup. And you also need to choose uh, some constants. Okay, some constants. Uh, so that, that's just like quasi geodesics, there's, there, there are some dependence on constants, okay, that you want to make, that you possibly want to make uniform. Okay, so defining these things are actually quite tricky. So I'm going to delay that all the way to the end so that even if I don't get there, it's not so bad, okay? <laughs> okay, but if, assuming that you know what most quasi geodesics are, then now you can talk about what is a most embedding, okay? So I say, given a, so if, uh, if X is a metric space, a geodesic metric space, okay? Then um, uh, F from X into uh, the remaining symmetric space M, is a MOS embedding. Okay, again, maybe uh, I can put a theta here. So there's a there's a dependence on theta. Okay, and so okay, if uh, uh, F sends geodesics in X, okay, to uniform. Data MOS quasi geodesic rays, quasi geodesics. Actually, I just need rays. To uniform uh, data MOS quasi geodesic rays inside of M. What is M here? Uh, my Riemannian symmetric space. So M, you can, so my G is always, like I said, my G is PGLDR. Yeah, G mod K. You can think of it as the set of uh, inner products on RD considered to scaling in this situation. Okay? So this is the, the definition of a MOS embedding modulo the definition of a MOS quasi geodesic. Okay? Okay, so... Um, so now I have two more things I want to do. First, I want to tell you how this is related to um, an Ossoff representations. And then find the last thing I want to do is I want to define most quasi geodesics for you. Okay? So here's a theorem that they proved. Where did it go? Okay, here. Okay, so let gamma be a finitely generated group. Okay, and rho from gamma to PGLDR 
uh, a representation. Okay, then the following are equivalent. So here it's important to note that my, I'm only assuming that gamma is finally, finally generated for now. Okay? So first, uh, the, or, the orbit map, so from gamma from M, uh, where I take gamma to rho gamma O, okay, is a theta Morse um, embedding. Actually, you know what? Let me not call this theta MOS. Let me call this P theta MOS. Okay, so this is a problem because uh, in the, the, the terminology and notation that Karpovich Lee Porti used differs from uh, um, the notation I've been using the, my, for my whole course so far. So what they call theta does, is not the same as what I mean by theta here. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so what I, when, I, when I say I choose theta inside of delta here, right, in the Karpovich Lee Porti world, they say you choose a phase, which they call tau mod, of the, mo of the model vowel chamber at infinity, they call sigma mod. Okay, so that's the, this, these two things are the same. Okay, I've been, I, I'm just gonna stick to this because I've been using this the whole time. Okay, uh, so. P data MOS embedding. Okay, second. Uh, this is a condition they call uh, uniformly regular and undistorted. Okay, so there exists constants, big C, little c, large n, zero, such that <coughs> you take any k in data, or I should just say my fixed data in delta. Okay, if I take any k inside of data, and for any gamma and gamma, <coughs> okay, uh, the logarithm of the ratio of the k to k plus one singular value of rho gamma, okay, is bounded above by one over c times the translation, dis the distance between gamma and the identity minus c. Okay, so we've already seen this before yesterday, right? But what we, should, what we saw was that if you are uh, P theta and Nosov, then uh, this, this condition holds, and if the existence of, when you have the existence of this transverse rho equivariant continuous limit map, then this here is equivalent to being P theta and Ossoff. Okay, uh, right now there's no more limit map. I don't need gamma to be hyperbolic. I just assume this condition here. Okay, and uh, so these two things are equivalent. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, and then the third statement, okay, now is, is that gamma is a hyperbolic group. Okay, and there exists a constant C larger than zero, such that for any gamma and gamma, okay, and for any K in theta, uh, one over C times the length of gamma, it's at least log of lambda k over lambda k plus one of rho of gamma. Okay, so again, we saw that this, yesterday we saw that if you are P theta and Ossoff, then this condition is true. Okay, but now the converse is also true, even without the existence of the, of the limit map. Okay, and fourth, gamma is a hyperbolic group. I guess I've been saying this the whole time, okay and rho is p theta and Ossoff. Okay, so let me uh, write down the names. So let me talk about, so I, okay, the equivalence between condition four and condition two, this was first proven by uh, Karpovich Lee Porti. Okay, but there was also a later, a very different proof by uh, Boki Porti Samarino. Okay, which is actually, very, I like a lot. Uh, I think it's much easier to understand. So, I, uh, so that's this. So um, like, like the, 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 the hardest part, I mean, I, I think the most interesting part of going from two is going from two to four, right? Which is how do you get the hyperbolicity of your group, okay? 
And basically, they use this theorem of Bowditch that was mentioned on the first day as well. Okay, where basically, if you have a, uh, if you know that you have a perfect compact metrizable space, right, uh, and and you have you have a gamma action on it that is a convergence group action that is uniform, then you know gamma is a hyperbolic group. Okay, and so what they do is using the fact that your singular values are growing. Right? You, then all your elements, aside from finitely many, all your elements have singular spaces. And you basically look at the accumulation set of the singular spaces. Okay? They are describing the limit set that way. And then using that, they, they, they have the gamma action there and they show that you have all the nice properties you want. And then that allows you to bring hyperbolicity into the picture. Okay? So that's this uh, to this. And then this one right, is due to a Casal poetry. Okay, so uh, one direction is easy. So if you go from, once you know this result here, uh, get, okay, and, and you know that, and you use a, a, a carbofishly protein or BPS to get hybridicity, then you can get this. Okay, but the hard part is going the converse, the other direction. Okay, inside of their paper, they actually have some examples to show that if you remove this, hypo, this, this assumption, right, then the converse is actually not true. Yeah. What do you mean by, for example, KP proof three? Do you mean? So I think what, what they what they did is they showed that if you have a suppose that gamma is a hyperbolic group, right, and you have this condition. Uh, they prove two implied three. So yeah, two equivalent. Under equivalent. equivalent. Yeah. And and KP and BPS, what did they prove? So they prove equivalence between two and four. Well, no, the, the whole theorem is KLP, yeah. but the way the history of this subject works is that there were three or four different yeah. groups not talking to each other, all converging on the same results, yeah. and so there's this weird kind of unidirectionality to the way things get proved. Okay, but the last one, so the last one, this one is, as far as I know, this one is KLP only, right? So the, the okay, I, I, think, uh, I think I'm going to stop soon, but let me just say that the hardest part, right, I mean, so I did not tell you the definition, but from the definition going from one to two is not that hard, right? It's, it's almost immediate from the definition, right? The hard part is going from two to one, okay? And this, this uh, Morse embedding, what it implies in particular is that if you, if you have a geodesic instead of gamma, right, and you map it into the symmetric space to get a quasi-geodesic, that quasi-geodesic actually tracks a flat, okay? That's what the Morse property tells you. And so, you need to, okay, it's regular, there's some regularity condition, plus it tracks a flat. So here you have the regularity condition already, okay? And what you need to show is that you need to start from this and show that the, your, your quasi geodesic actually have to track a flat, okay? Um, so I think my time is up. Oh, wait, no, I have 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes. Oh, gosh, okay, I forgot. Okay, good, good, let's. Okay. So now I can... Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, before I'm raising, uh, yeah. it, what is the counterexample when, uh, uh, for, when you don't assume uh, gamma is a hyperbolic group? I, 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 can't remember. I, I, I can't remember. Sorry, you have to you have to ask the authors. Yeah, I can I, I can look at I mean I, I can look in the paper and I, I can uh, tell you later. Yeah, yeah, Casa Poetry. Yeah. I just remove that. <coughs> okay, so what is a Morse quasi geodesic? Okay, so, uh, okay, let me just write that down. What is a Morse quasi geodesic? Okay, so to, to, to explain this, I need to know a little bit more about the, the structure of flats and valve chambers inside of the symmetric space. Okay, so let me just recall uh, some things that uh, Jean-François mentioned in his, in his uh, mini course. Okay, so first if you, it, okay, my, my symmetric space here is M. 
Okay, and I would like to think of it as the set of inner products on RD. Okay, consider up to scaling. Okay, you have a natural PGLDR action on this set, and the stabilizer is a, is a maximal compact. Okay, <coughs> now if you pick any inner product, any point B inside of M, okay, then uh, the, I'm going to let KB denote the stabilizer in G of this point B, so it's, up, it's conjugate to your, your maximal compact. Okay, and then uh, you can look at this Lie algebra, which I don't like, little KB, Mafrak KB. Okay, and then you can, there's this complementary subspace you can define, right, which uh, Jean Francois called M, I think. Okay, and that's what he used to get the Katam decomposition. Okay, so this guy here is the. If you want this, you can think of this as the perpendicular to this guy respect to the killing form. Okay, and if you take uh, this this guy, because um, so you notice that your M here can be written as G uh, quotient out by KB because you have a transitive G action on the on M. Okay, and the stabilizes KB. And so uh, if you look at the MB, you can think of this as the tangent space at the identity coset KB of G mod KB, or if you wish, the tangent space to B at M. Okay? So this is my MB. All right, and then uh, a fact that he also alluded to is that if you look at the set of maximal abelian uh, subspaces in MB, okay, this is in bijection with the set of uh, maximal flats in M that contain B. Okay, uh, and, and here the bijection is easy to say. You take any maximal abelian subspace inside of MB, right, and you send it to exp A prime dot B. Okay, so here I'm only taking, because remember, if you take a maximal abelian uh, sub-algebra of G, you might have some parts that live in, okay, actually in, in our example, it just lives in MP, so okay. Okay, I mean, you, if, if more generally, you might have some part of the maximal some rotation part that lives in K, but you want to ignore that, you only want to take the translation part, the part that lives in MB. Okay, so this gives you all the maximal flats. Okay, and then uh, for any uh, such maximal abelian subspace, right? Uh, John Francois also said that if you, you can look at, you can exponentiate it, and you look at its action on the Lie algebra when at join, and that is simultaneously diagonalizable, and you can look at the eigenspaces, and that gives you the roots, right? The restricted roots. So those are sigma primes. You can do that here. Okay? And then uh, if you take uh, A prime and you remove the kernels of everything in sigma prime, so this is a finite subset inside of the duo. A prime star, okay? Okay, so now if you take the A prime, okay, so maybe I'll just give you this a name. So A, a vowel chamber, in A prime, right, is, um, <coughs> a, is the closure of a connected component, okay, of uh, uh, A prime minus the union of all alpha and sigma primes of the kernel of alpha. <coughs> okay, so the <coughs> The standard example of this, okay, is that if you choose, uh, if you look at the point B naught, right, inside of M, which is the inner product corresponding to the standard inner product, right, standard inner product, okay, then when you look at the Cartan decomposition, you can decompose your G into the symmetric matrices and skew symmetric matrices, 
Okay, the, the symmetric ones are going to be the MB. And then uh, inside of this, the symmetric matrices, you can choose your A to be the diagonal matrices. So you can choose your A here to be the diagonal matrices. Okay, and then uh, my my uh, and what is what is my sigma here? So my sigma, right? So my sigma prime in this special case, I'm, I'm just going to call it sigma. These are the linear functionals of the form alpha i j, such that i is not equal to j, running from one to d. Okay, so what are these alpha i j's? The alpha i j takes a one to a d to ai minus aj, okay? And then uh, your a plus, right, you can take it as the diagonal matrices whose entries are decreasing down the diagonal, right? So that is the target of my Cartan and Jordan projections that I mentioned yesterday, right? So the same a plus. Okay, all right, so that's my valve chamber. Then now, uh, my, so then I say that a valve chamber in the symmetric space M with tip B right, is uh, is the X is of is something of the form X of A prime plus times B for some um, uh, vowel chamber A prime plus instead of A prime. Okay, so let me draw a picture to illustrate what's going on here, right? So here's my symmetric space M. Okay, and I pick my base point B. Okay, and then uh, I okay, and then I choose and I look at the tangent space and I choose a. Okay, I look at the tangent space which is the MB and I choose a flat in there. Okay, so this is my flat and uh, so this is inside of A prime. Okay, inside of MB, and when you exponentiate this and multiply by B. Okay, what it does is it just takes this flat and maps it, uh, takes this uh, R2 and maps it into this flat here, okay, isometrically. Okay, and then <coughs> if you look at any each of these sectors, so these three lines are supposed to be the kernels of the things in sigma, okay, and you look this, so this guy here is a vowel chamber instead of A. I look at its closure, and when I exponentiate it, what I get is something here, okay, and the, the tip of this guy is at B. Okay, so this is the picture you should think about. Okay, and I have this, so every time I have a point B, I have lots of vowel chambers with tip B, okay, inside of the symmetric space, okay. Okay, so what are there, there are a few facts that I need here the f about the, the action of G on the vowel, vowel chambers, right? So first, uh, the G action on the set of vowel chambers in M is transitive. Okay, furthermore, okay, so and if you look at the stabilizer of a vowel chamber, that's not trivial, but it acts trivially on the vowel chamber as well. Okay, so if G in G fixes or stabilizes a vowel chamber in M,
Okay, then it fixes it point wise. Okay, and this is really what allows you to define the vowel chamber value distance that uh, John Francois was talking about. Okay, so if I have a, I take any, in my symmetric space, I take any vowel chamber anywhere else. Okay, you can move it to this guy uh, using an element of G. Okay, and so if you if you pick any point in the if you pick any pair of points in the symmetric space, you can find a you find a, a vowel chamber whose tip is at the first point and contains the second point, and you move it using the element G so that the, the tip goes to this tip and the point goes to somewhere here, and that gives you your vowel chamber value distance. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't have time for this. Okay, maybe. Okay, let, let, me, let me do this. Let me just tell you what uh, are the objects when theta equals to delta, because then it's uh, a lot less technical. So suppose theta equals to delta. Okay. Then if you pick any two points, P and Q, inside of your symmetric space, and you suppose that the vowel chamber value distance between them I need to make some more definitions first. Okay, so I'm gonna let uh, so uh, take uh, let B be a positive constant. Okay, and then I'm gonna define A B plus to be the set of vectors A X in A plus. So my standard uh, vowel chamber. So that okay, A one to A D in A plus. Okay, so that. Uh, the difference between adjacent entries are um, at least b times the length of the vector. Okay, so inside of my vowel chamber, I'm picking out this. I'm picking out this this subset here. Okay, which depends on b. Right, the slope of these two blue lines depend on B. Okay. Okay. So now, I I suppose that I pick two points P and Q. Okay, and I assume that the vowel chamber value distance between P and Q uh, lies inside of AB plus. Okay. So if I use an uh, element in the isometry group to move P to the B naught and move Q into the positive vowel chamber, it actually lies inside of that blue region. Okay. Then. Uh, you can find oops then you can find this uh, vowel chamber with tip P con that contains Q and the blue part lies inside of Q in fact okay and then because I'm assuming that theta equals to delta, if this happens, the vowel chamber value distance between Q and P also aligns out of AB plus. Okay, so you have the same picture on the other side as well. Okay, and this uh, common region here, right, given by this two blue things, this is called the diamond. Okay, but in this case, it's the delta diamond between P and Q. Okay. Um, all right, <coughs> so let me just say that now, you. so this is uh, not just delta, there's a B involved as well, right? That's the choice of my, so the delta diamond is usually the, the if you don't, okay, so th this is called, because there's a, there's a B dependence, right? It tells you what's the, the shrinking in the, diamond that I'm using here, okay? So this is the theta B diamond. And so, uh, okay, my time is up. So let me just say that in the case when theta equals to delta, a Morse qua a, a quasi geodesic is called D theta B Morse. So it depends on D. Okay, there's a delta, in theta is delta here, and B Morse. If, when it, so first it has to be a quasi geodesic, okay? 
And when if you take uh, any two points along the quasi-Jurassic, right, those two points must be debounded. I mean, you, you, can, you can find one of these delta B diamonds, okay, so that the entire quasi-Jurassic between those two points must lie within the distance D of that diamond. Okay, so they are basically replacing the Jurassic with this diamond here as their definition. Okay, and once you, from that, you can see that um, they are basically just forcing the moss properly to hold. Okay, and, uh, and then they prove the local to global principle. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, so um, in the first part of the lecture, you said that weekly regular convex co-compactness is nice because it lets you create non-surface group examples of an offset representation. Mm -hmm. What sort of classes of examples can you make? Um, can you do anything other than free groups? Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, for, so one, one thing is... Um, to notice is that uh, HN yeah. is a, you know, it, it can be realized as a properly convex domain with C1, with C1 boundary. Yeah. So, you know, if you have any uh, convex co-convex subgroup of HN, right, this allows you to build examples of P1 Nosov representations that's like Zariski dense inside of PGLDR if you yeah. wish. Yeah. So like Coxeter groups. Yeah, or, or you can do, yeah, you can use Coxeter groups as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, what does the the diamond look like? I guess for theta not equal to delta. Yeah, so that one is much more complicated. So if you look at this picture here, right? So it, yeah, so basically, if you pick a theta, that corresponds to picking a face of this sim of this uh, simplicial cone, right? Okay, not okay. So. A lower, so, okay, let me say this. If you pick a theta, and then you look at all the alphas that are not in the theta, and you look at the common intersection of all the kernels, that gives you a lower dimensional phase of this cone, okay? And basically, you want to look at the union of all the vowel chambers that share that, that, that has that edge, yeah. right? So in this picture, yeah, it's gonna be, yeah, it's, it's, there are gonna be infinitely many of this, you know, this, uh, Vow chambers that contain this guy, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, okay, and uh, and that that is the that is what they call a vowel cone, mm -hmm. the union of all of these things is called a vowel cone with tip B, mm -hmm. okay, and then the diamond. Huh. If theta is on one dimension, then you get this one dimensional line, and then does it correspond to look at centralized of this one dimensional line? The, yeah, so you yeah, that's right. You look at you you take your the the vowel chamber and you apply any element in the stabilizer of the tip. Okay, that stabilizes that line. That's right. That centralizes that line. Okay. okay? So that's where like products of orthogonal yeah. groups come in. And then you, you take the union of all of those, but you also need to still ensure this, you need to still choose this B to get a, a, a proper cone. Okay? And then, uh, for, and then the theta Morse condition now is that if you pick any two points along your quasi Jurassic, instead of saying that you can find, a, I mean, when you sweat, the diamonds now are, are given by intersections of two opposite, two of these opposite cones, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, the quasi geodesic must stay within bounded distance of this diamond, right, yes, yes. which is no longer, no longer in a flat anymore. It's a union, union of flat pieces, yeah. So it's a union of flat pieces, but in each flat piece, uh, you think of like this capital B. Yes, that's right, that's right, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Tangred again for a great work.